save this this thought to be shared at kind of the end to show my gratitude and all that. But, you know, I, I guess I could also kind of mention it here in the beginning, too, is that um, I, I philosophy, my encounter with philosophy is is one in which philosophy itself is ambiguity manifested in a cultural tradition of thought and and debate and exercise. And whenever there is an attempt to pin down ambiguity, you do create a completely new path of, of exploration, a, an uncharted path in which you can create a completely new discipline of. You know, this is the case with science being born out of natural philosophy. And mm. um, when you try to marry something like design and philosophy it's it's in some ways a paradox to me because i think that design is one of those branches that came out of philosophy already and to basically incestuous incestuously combine again to philosophy um is an interesting path in my opinion hmm. um but Nevertheless, it's it's one of those things where if it works out, it's not something that you want to miss out on. And so mm. I I joined naturally to kind of see if this group of individuals have, have stumbled upon something that um, could be, you know, a, a, a new finding of sorts, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. I. I, I... I think I agree largely with what you said. Uh, although I, I would, I would say that. Um, now, before I go further, because because we are stuck in the entrance of this uh, of this uh, you know virtual room, and and that's that's weird. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I yeah, let's move up. Um, uh, Thai, I, I hope I pronounce well your name. Thai, um, you you can. Sorry. It's Timmy. Timmy. Okay. Okay. So, uh, with your um, uh, key, yeah, uh, on your keyboard with the arrow, uh, you know, the, the the arrows, you can move up, left, right, okay. bottom. So let's move up to the to the. Yes, yes. Uh, but are you looking for? Uh, I'm looking for the the arrow. On your keyboard? Do you, do you do, can you use the the arrows on your keyboard? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. <laughs> cool and uh okay i will take this uh spot and let's drink something so if you click on the table there's uh, some drinks and it will randomly give you some something to drink at least uh virtually <laughs> i have my own uh glass of wine uh so up to you to take whatever <laughs> Is the best for you. Um, and um, oh wow, Scotch. Yeah, yeah, Woodford Reserve. <laughs> okay, so uh, just for like uh, Timmy, it's the f it's the first time for you. Uh, so just for kind of a, a roundup of what we discussed so far uh so we had like it's a third um time we meet for this kind of discussion about design and philosophy and um uh we had like a, a general conversation about design and philosophy in the first session and the second one was more oriented towards uh, action and decision making um and the idea of this one is to discuss about this uh, tension between being pragmatic as designers and mm -hmm. being creative because it's it's part of the exercise as well so we'll we'll find how i mean there's no real like uh agenda or thing like that for this kind of discussion it's really open-ended so whatever comes to your mind you don't hesitate to share uh what are what what is in your mind and um 
and we'll see what happens. You know, it's like it's like that. This kind of discussion where we we see what happens <laughs> during the conversation. Okay. okay. Um, and and for, just for a, a side note, we are no philosophers here, and we are for most of us designers. So, <laughs> so that's where we, you know, this is where we inform our thoughts. Uh, I would say, but uh, I don't want to uh, overgeneralize. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, I see that we have someone, Demi. Hey, hello. <laughs> uh, don't hesitate to move up with the keyboard, with the arrows. You can move up. We are on the couches on top. <laughs> Okay, then, um, yeah, to what you said, uh, Matt, about um, the fact that it was some kind of paradox to talk about design and philosophy because you feel like it's, it's something, design is something that comes naturally from philosophy. I, I totally agree with you. Um, maybe in, historically, um, it's not, in the detail, in the fine details, I, I don't feel like it's necessarily always true, but for most of what it, it you know it, it it is and it has been i, I tend to agree with you uh, now i do feel like from from i don't know if it's so recent and i i don't know if i oversimplify the thing and it's probably the case because you know it's it's what i have in mind and it doesn't account for a, everything that happens but i i feel like since um I probably since uh, the industrialization, the mass industrialization of goods, we expect design to be more like what engineering is in the sense that we, we expect people from design to be, to be good engineers in that sense, right? And, and not necessarily good creative people or art, uh, artists. We don't expect them to be artists because, because then it, it you know, it, uh, this, the the main idea of industrialization is 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 that it's mass produce produce so there's no um, um, there's there's less the, this part of uh, artisan uh, you know mastery of uh, of what we are doing right and it has to be easily reproducible by anyone in that sense and I don't know if it's the main explanation but it's it's easy to see how this land you know lit the, the the field the profession in this in direction where we we don't want necessarily these people to you know discuss so much about um, the philosophical grounds uh, from which it design you know uh, evolved and and where it is today uh, and more you know in the direction of of basic of doers uh, most of the time. I, I don't say it's necessarily bad. This is where I want to clarify that I don't say it's necessarily bad, but that's something I, I, I do feel, you know, favorized some connection with other fields uh, and defavorized connection with other fields like philosophy and arts and stuff like that. Uh, I don't say that every designer should be an artist or that you know every designer should be a philosopher, um, but I do feel like a design by nature is is necessary at, in the at the intersection of many dif disciplines, and when by definition we favorize one over others, we you know we oversee some of the aspects of what we are doing. And that's that's by design, in that sense. So I, I don't see it as uh, something that we can necessarily escape. But it's interesting to, you know, sometimes from time to time to come back to those kind of things and see how relevant it is for, for us. So that's about what I have to say about what you said. Yeah, I, I, I missed it. See, uh, hello, everybody. Um, one of the things that struck me when I went to grad school for design was it was the first time that I had considered that 
the, a process that the design process itself was something that could be commodified, right? That there was this kind of meta thing that happened at that point where you kind of, you kind of understand like, oh, well, well, design process is kind of a personal thing and you find a way mixing all these things together. And then all of a sudden somebody points out, well, you know, these processes are being commodified and sold as something that you have to kind of purchase like whole in a way. And it was the first time that I ever, ever actually come across that, which is, I remember that being a kind of a, a strange wake up call as to the way that the industry values design. Right, that, that there was two things. That there was the, the the repeatable, almost non-creative process, right? The kind of machinic. You know, you put it in one side, and you know, it's it's it, it, you put it through the grinder, and the widget comes out the other side. And then there's the actual individual with the who is creative. And, and it was a, I have to. It was a weird moment. It took me a while to get to kind of come to terms with that. Idea, because I never really thought about it as a as a non-creative process. So um, I I am not a designer and I am not a philosopher. So I'm I'm neither. Or uh, I was trained as an engineer, and so since um, Kevin, you were kind of mentioning the commoditization aspect of design, and Mark, you you did too. Um, I, I want to say something a little bit about, as a, from an engineering perspective, how um, there is, uh, how how there is a clear. <laughs> this is all, almost oxymoronic, but clear ambiguity towards optimizing this type of commoditization of. Uh, of goods, like for instance, you, um, a concrete example is um, that. Have you heard of the term like you know, uh, designed obsolescence, right? Or or gimping mm -hmm. um, a product yeah. or, yes. or nerfing a product. Yeah. yeah. So um, you, you so there is one of those principles um, of design. I mean, it's called design obsolescence. So this is designed and where you are basically fabricating an inefficiency for a market purpose, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want a product to be too successful. Um, and, and this is the case with NVIDIA GPUs, right? Like basically the, they, they can make at the same cost this really superior design architecture chip. But uh, that would um, commodify the uh, the their intellectual property, and they wouldn't be able to extract the maximum monetization out mm -hmm. of that particular design. And so, what they end up doing is they create different classes. One which is the you know the top tier class, and then the second they use the same GPU uh, architecture, but they use software uh, to gimp it, right, to nerf uh, its power, and you know. And design obsolescence of, of of other kinds you know, through software, and so there is this notion, at least from for me as from an engineering perspective, right, of this irrationality when you combine um, the disciplines of management and design or whatever um, to 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 perform these types of things that that you know. For us engineers, we find it to be like perverse, right? <laughs> and, and I think you know, to to a part of you who is not just a professional designer, but as a consumer, you would think that this is perverse as well. Um, but it's a reality, and um, yeah, you know, I I I, I might want to talk a little bit about this in the context of pragmatism because pragmatism, of course, is to combine market realities along with ideas and solution spaces, right? For, for you know, fixing client problems and consumer problems and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, well, one thing along that line, I haven't read into it, but I think I read yesterday or the day before that 
Apple has opened up the power, the uh, MacBook Pros with the M1 chips, opened it up to be repairable, right? Like that, that just happened. And so this notion of right to repair mm-hmm. right, falls into that thing. And so the, the question for me is, if we're bringing it back, is like planned obsolescence or nerfing, is that a design philosophy? Or is that a product, like, does it fall into like, because philosophy can be used in that kind of very like prosaic way, right? Just a way of thinking about what's right. So definitions wise, it's kind of, that's what, that's what came up to me. But I mean, because, and it's the same thing with something like, um, oh, what are they calling it now? Cyclical design, cradle to gray, cradle to cradle, you know, the whole like the, yeah. I think it's, um, I think it's called the, the new, the current term is cyclical design, right? Cyclical yeah, well, sustainability. Is that uh, circular design? Circular. circular design? Yeah. yeah, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah, that's the word I was looking for. Yeah, circular design. Yeah, so is that a philosophy? Right, does that fit into that category? Because yeah. the word is a, you know, it's, it's philosophy is a flexible term. But you do get these divergent and convergent spaces throughout history where designers at some point were connected to the object of design, but now they're kind of mediated through a process, whether it's standardized or you know, more personalized. Uh, and it's, it's, it's interesting what uh, Kevin was saying at the beginning, something around the craftsman's, craftsmanship of the designer and the fact that you could kind of imbue, infuse it with your intent, with the impact you wanted to have, it was part of you in a sense, and then you would let it go. But nowadays, the way we define our products are not so tied to the, the ones who design it. It's more like wow. they get lost in an endless value chain and whoever markets it and whatever happens, but that identity is completely removed in, in most uh, most spaces like you don't know who designed the MacBook Pro. You know, there's probably a whole teams that came and went out and came in and you know so on. So there's this dissolution of the designer, and that makes it very hard to actually have a philosophy. At most, you could have some sort of left wing philosophy, maybe some communism added in there, maybe like you know, it, it would make more sense in that sense in that way. But uh, at the same time, it's it's really hard to find the right grounds to, to, to bring, you know, something that fits diversity. And at the same time, it allows for this dissolution of the identity. But I don't know. It's uh, I think it's a, it's a fascinating thing to actually ask what is the philosophy behind something? Because if you look at products Microsoft design, you can actually identify that philosophy. They talk about one philosophy that they promote maybe in the world, but then you're looking at the products and you're like, is that a true reflection? What does it actually mean? Like with the NVIDIA, NVIDIA is like all about experiences and like really, you know, wrecking your brain, but then they offer you this weird glitch that you have to keep on consuming it. So there's a dark side to it. Is there a, you know, white philosophy and there's a shadow, kind of light and shadow philosophies that mm. clash together. Yeah. So. Yeah, I feel like it's interesting to see how, like, maybe it's not so clear what is the philosophy behind the current movement in design or like as services and products today, but we can we can look at what are the myths that are attached to what we are, like our disciplines, right? And I feel like sometimes in the past where, where most products were still physical products, um, there were this, um, this, um, yes, this myth around uh, the good product as, um, as it can be manufactured uh, through like its quality as the material used to create it and and stuff like that, right? There's some kind of uh, myth and and legends around what 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 was good design at that time. And, and today, I feel like uh, the, the the discourse has moved around uh, business and 
uh, psychology as two main things that somehow creates uh, good products. And, you know, there's this reappropriation of uh, good design that we can see, like, Apple is notorious for that. Like, everyone has a story about Apple being the company that has the most, you know, uh, uh, like UX architects or the most, uh, you know, uh, actually uh, behavioral uh, designers or stuff like that. And each time it's a different story, but with the same basis, you know, like the iPhone was created, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, there's always these kind of stories. And I do feel like, I do feel like it's, it's interesting how those stories are repurposed for the new kind of uh, philosophy that we have right now. Like, um, Recycling philosophy. <laughs> yeah, that, that's that would be an interesting. Yeah, that's. I mean, um, we do this uh, with a lot of things. Like you know, in... There's greenwashing, and, and <laughs> that's in a sense, it's a type of philosophy so that can happen with philosophy overall. You just need to repackage it a little, rebrand yeah, philosophy. Maybe it's it's more like uh, composting than <laughs> recycling in that sense. You know, because because it, it, it you need some type type of you need some time for some ideas to. Um, to sink in the, you know, uh, the general uh, discourse about something for it to become, like, obvious. And in that sense, it's, you know, as they, it goes through the layers, uh, it's some form of, uh, you, could, you could say, as a metaphor, it's some form of uh, composting more than uh, recycling. But, um, yeah, I feel like the stories we tell about what we do are good indicators of 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 the of the philosophy that most designers have uh, and sometimes i feel like it's interesting to see how some philosophies are actually uh contradicting each other's but still exist in the same space uh where where i like i'm in some you know communities in design where we have discussed about good user research as the foundation of good design and at the same time uh, a, a similar discourse about uh, good graphic, visual graphic design foundations as being the foundation of of, uh, of good design, and they are not necessarily always uh, contra- contradicting each other's, but in in some cases it is, and and not, most people don't think about how they resolve actually uh, the, the issue. It's like it's some some kind of it it fits the the, the current story as. You, you put the, the lens you want to, to, to have like, about what you are doing, right? So, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think, I, you know, so accepting contradiction. Oh, sorry, Kevin, you can finish. finish no, I talk, think it's, please. it's Jonathan who wanted to say something at the same time than you, so. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, hello. So it, it works, you hear me <laughs> hey. this time. Last yes. time I had lots of issues. <laughs> so... Um, hello everyone. Uh, as two comments, uh, the the first one was uh, bouncing off something Kevin said, which, which um, that uh, this difference between physical and digital, and there's this uh, this really interesting article I, I read a few years ago, and I always kind of remembered it. It's from a guy called Alex Danko, and he talked about this notion of pointy businesses and the idea is that digital one of the the the, the features of uh, the digital or computational space is that you can have um, very specific functions so meaning you want to get something done there will be only a certain set of solutions that will uh, uh, enable you to achieve some kind of function that you want to achieve. And uh, so, for instance, if you look at websites, you have basically the same underlying technology, and one is going to be super focused on delivering some kind of function, another one's going to deliver another kind of function. And so, uh, and migrating between functions is no longer so much of, a, of, a, of an issue. There's n- not so much inertia in changing the kinds of functions you want to deliver. And that, therefore, the um, it, it becomes very much a matter of of your choice of what you're going to deliver as a function becomes more and more 
important. Whereas in the past, there were so many variables. If you look at physical products, so the, the, in this article, it kind of says, okay, so you have kind of a Gaussian kind of functional delivery for physical products. And, and for digital products, it's more like a pointy function. So you can really be specific. Okay, I'm just going to deliver this and that and this with this and this uh, cost. And with physical products, it's much more diffused. And, and so it, it leaves a lot, lot more room for, um, for, for consumers to, 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 it makes it more difficult for consumers to, to choose between different kinds of products and functionalities. And so I think that's kind of an interesting idea, this idea of pointy businesses. And the second comment that um, regarding the, this notion of philosophy and design, there's this uh, famous uh, saying, quote, by I don't know who, that says something like digital is eating the world or something. I don't remember exactly who said this quote. And I have the feeling that maths and science is eating philosophy. And uh, the, so a lot of the questions that were typically philosophical questions uh, end up in fact being more mathematical and cognitive science questions and empirical questions. So the, the, the question is, okay, what is left then in philosophy that something like yeah. science and maths cannot really um, address? And I think it's basically um, this notion of terminal um so this is of, of value um we lost you for yeah you for some seconds uh we we, we didn't say value so yeah yes can you can you repeat uh, like uh, from values yeah. we didn't uh, hear anything from what you said sorry so so i terminal i think what what no i think you have a connection issue you might need to move somewhere else or yeah yeah we don't hear you anymore it's like uh you're going through a, t a tunnel something like that <laughs> yeah sorry you spoke ill of the digital <laughs> well jonathan brought up some really interesting points um i think the I think the person who <laughs> so, so Jonathan, it, it, uh, it I will BBC. just mute you because because we we don't hear you well. It's like it's getting yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry. It's like you you have a bad connection and we don't hear exactly what you you are saying. Sorry. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, the 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 quote about software eating the world. That's um, the VC tech investor Mark Andreessen who said yes. that. And mm. I, I think Jonathan um, made up made made some pretty interesting points about um, that philosophy is now a dead carcass, and the the, the last remaining wisdom uh, is is being eaten now by by you know the smartest scientists and mathematicians that are left, right? And um, <laughs> and so what is left of this carcass now, you know, is just decomposing and rot and and now designers are here to eat the rest of it you know we're just <laughs> maggots <laughs> but i think you know you're all pointing out something really interesting which is kind of underlying all the disciplines which is this pursuit for precision trying to have a sense of precision in whatever domain you you find yourself in but the problem is and what we see you know it kind of uh, don both on philosophy and uh, design is that precision is more can be achieved in on a tactical level but not on a let's say on a strategic level you can fa you can kind of feed certain like short term intentions but when it comes to the bigger picture and sort of yeah rippling it out it, it does create this risk of just losing altogether what you you have in mind so i guess this uh, really puts into perspective 
kind of what's happening. We kind of live with the symptoms of these different attempts to, to be precise because philosophy is dying on its own too. You, you get the analytical philosophy, which is, you know, I like it, but it's a nightmare to look at. It's so mathematical, so logical. And if you don't have that foundation, you're just going to have a headache. You need Adderall to keep up. So it's a, uh, it's that kind of situation. But uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I science do doesn't get there. I, I do feel like philosophy is not something that anyone owns anymore, anyway. So it's it's like it's it's not really a space. It's something that is divided between spaces, and and for that reason, we feel like it's it is dying. But I, I don't agree necessarily with that statement. Uh, I, I do feel like it, it's still living and <laughs> and maybe not dying, of a... but like there's a self destruction period in it in a sense like yeah. just uh, thinking about the academic environment that it's becoming even more closed mm. and they are like specific branches are just really trying to survive but they're not really giving they're just kind of yeah, closing yeah. in they're trying to converge towards precision and i think yeah. that's the, the danger with even with design, with these processes, like Mark was pointing out, having these standardized and really cold and repeatable, because that's what you want. You want repeatable processes to scale. So then design becomes this tool for taking out, taking itself out of the equation in the in the long run. And I think this is what needs to be brought back, this thinking more about the outcomes, thinking more about the <clears throat> what lies at the end and distill yeah, take out the processes for a while, or at least, yeah, just ignore them if it's possible. Not all yeah. of them. Yeah, I, I think. Part yeah, go ahead, Mark. Is, it was, oh, sorry. Thanks, Kevin. Part of, I had this metaphor in my head, which was um, if you go out and you want to design a new train, right, you still have to design it to be on the rails that exist as the infrastructure, mm. right? And so that's the kind of pointy business kind of kind of problem, right? You are you're limited because it's a stratification and you have to fit into some kind of layer, you know, whether it's TCP IP or some other thing that's, that's out there. You're, you're, you're working within the bounds of a layer and design has always worked within uh, constraints. Right? Yes. yes. Which, which, which I think is, it's actually part of the, like you need them to, to do what it is we're doing. So in some way, the philosophy of design has to be a philosophy of constraints or at least addressing constraints and understanding them and how it is that you navigate them and what what is your relationship to those constraints, right? Is it an adversarial relationship? Is it, a, you know, is it, do you, do you bend and not break? You know, like what's the, what's that relationship? So I think you have to, that, that those constraints become necessary. Mm -hmm. And that makes, and again, that because design is so context-based, the, the nature of those constraints vary greatly depending on what you're doing and so whatever you know use of philosophy that you have within the process of design needs to be flexible enough to be contextualized yeah but which kind of brings in you know kind of circling back on the previous um uh marriage of design and philosophy discussion i i know that one was the one that went kind of political for some reason <laughs> and and that is kind of one of the reasons why we decide to kill it with this final <laughs> meeting. But, but I think the point that you were trying to make, Mark, was actually uh, a very good way of tying it back to the previous discussion about politics, which is um, rather than talking about constraints and designing within, you know, a traditionalist network, you can you can opt to take risks by deciding not to be traditionalist, right? One of the things about Apple's, you know, MacBook design as a success, which was to, you know, kind of bring in brushed aluminum and, and make it into a premium luxury feel over just generic plastic. And that was a risk taking, um, you know, design approach. And it was, it was against tradition. It was political. It was, you know, a kind of a political revolution in a sense, right? Of let's not go um, to, you know, maximizing, you know, um, performance versus cost and just go straight for this type of abstract 
um, value, mm -hmm. and it, it became a success. I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm I, I'm not sure if I'm buying that. To me, that it feels like a quarter esque play where the others aren't <laughs> positioning your product kind of move, which is I think still working within the you know. You, it's like the question I ask students in the first year. When you are, design is in a sense a form of argumentation, right? Like, and you can, in what you are designing, design for and against the current, like the status quo. And design as restyling is this kind of interesting place of Yes, we're doing design, but we're not actually changing the structure because restyling this idea of newness and novelty or repositioning or putting a different shell on something actually reinforces the, the structure that's in place, which is I must buy a new thing every year. And the difference in that thing will be marginal improvement in performance, but more so a difference in styling. And that it's very, and, and it, it's it's a kind of aesthetic planned obsolescence right? Mm -hmm. that's built in to circle this path, right? So I, I think that the to me, the idea of using a different material is a you know a strategic positioning play, but still plays within the same box of potential constraints. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, so I don't see it as revolutionary. I don't see it as revolutionary as like say, you know, like a Buckminster Fuller dome. Mm -hmm. And the, the entire Gesamtkunstwerk that was like, you know, because it's not, it wasn't just about the dome, right? It was about a whole new way of living and addressing conditions and this kind of utopian thing. And so to me that the Buckminster Fuller move is further kind of off the rails, if you will, than the Mac design, <laughs> right? Um, and, and you can go back to, and I'm not saying it's not creative, because I even think like the, what they call it, like the blueberry Mac, you know? With that, with the ridiculous round mouse, which was the dumbest piece of um, computer <laughs> product design kind of ever um, thing. But yeah, it's like there, there's always been, I think there's room for creativity within it, but I think you're still painting within the lines. And I think that that's creativity constrained and still put into work for market forces that exist, right? It's not really challenging anything. It's just finding a new way to color differently within the lines. Well, right. Uh, I, I would just say that, um, well, so like, I, I understand your, that point of disagreement and like, I guess, I guess I kind of agree with you that it's not, it isn't really revolutionary, but what I am trying to kind of come up with is this idea that was touched upon earlier by Kevin, which is that, um, a, a lot of the things that are consistent in terms of its principles have contradictory uh, overhauls at the end. Like for instance, um, Apple is one of those companies where the product kind of defines its branding, right? In, in a very concrete sense. So th their risk-taking and their success kind of defines what the company is. Like, you know, you, you, you think of the MacBook and you, you immediately think, you know, Apple, did this right this brush aluminum thing and it's not that it's design and design revolutionary in terms of impact but it's more of a of a political success in the sense that um they 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 took a, a risk a, a risk that is um you know what what drives you know a company to take risks is is also a very um uh, interesting point because Apple was kind of like on a financial verge of bankruptcy when jobs, you know, returned, right? And basically they were in the mood to take risks. And um, and that kind of like recategorize or, you know, their 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 culture in a sense, right? And um and, and so they were just in the process of, you know, um, being being a factory of, you know, creative risk taking. Hmm. And um, and that that defined it's not their product, it's their culture, but at the same time, their product, you know, kind of feeds back in the culture. And so and so um, it, there, there is this associated um, 
branding, if you will, of, of, of a sort of excellence that is tied into Apple. But that's, that excellence is really just by virtue of their commercial success. What we, what we should really concentrate on is maybe they, their risk taking comes from a different form, not geared towards, you know, directly uh, commercial success, but to, you know, appeal on like a, you know, innate level uh, to, to uh, the human customer. That's, that's what I would argue is, is somewhat revolutionary, right? Is, is this radical departure from um, technical specification uh, chasing. Yeah, I just want to say something because uh, I think I, I see a connection to what I had in mind so far. So, so I, I try to stick, you know to put everything that was said together and uh, give like my my understanding of it. But um, I, I feel like I agree with um, uh, I, I think I agree with you too uh, on, on that. I, I don't feel like there's necessarily a a, a big like a, a point of contention there um, what I, I want to say is first that we I think it's important to say that creativity and design is defined by by constraints um, but then we can say that there's different type of constraints that there's all, not all the same that some constraints are uh, um, are exist for like and give just a, 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 a margin of of variability within two like highly defined uh, within an highly defined space where where you can only you know do things so far as you are in those uh, margins right and and some constraints are more like enabling new ideas new things that are different or unexpected given the original states uh, that we we, we came uh, from. So we, we can say that there's different type of, of constraints and they don't they will not generate the same type of outcomes uh, if if we look at it as a as a design and um, as a creativity um, you know space. So I, I feel like it's interesting to 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 say that because because um, most companies that do what you just discussed like just uh, change a little thing each year to just say we we are still here. Basically, this is uh, they play by by the the constraints that are a, a, a space that is highly defined, uh, that is really clear, uh, and they they play with just some variability of what could be done with, within that highly defined space, right? So there's there's clearly no originality here. It's just playing by 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 the rule and not changing anything, right? And and there's some some things that come that that change like like largely what what has been done so far, right? That that are clear point of uh, of um, of change for something. And what I find interesting with Apple and it's something that is that is uh, mirrored in uh, in the business in general is. I, when they had to change drastically things and come up with something really totally new, it was, as you said, Matt, when they were at the, you know, at the verge of bankruptcy or something that, that was highly critical for their business. Right. And, and counterintuitively they did what most companies today are not able to do or not willing to do is betting on something that is radically different from what they were doing so far. I don't mean radically different by just something that is extraordinarily, you know, novel or stuff like that. But from from what has been done in that space was was different, right? And and this is not something that many companies has been is able to do. Like usually, when companies are not good in <laughs> financial aspect, we 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 change the CEO and we put a guy which is here to, you know, um, uh, make sure that. Uh, we lower cost and we don't go in the extremely, you know, risky bets that uh, that uh, some company like Apple was able to do. I, I'm not sure that today they would be able to do, by the way, the same thing that they, they have been 
uh, doing so far. So that's uh, an interesting point. And and to come to pragmatism and, and creativity, we, we see here um, something that is interesting for, for design and, and creativity, which is which is that sometimes we need to stick by by the rule to to do what we, we are doing. And sometimes we have to reframe what is the current space to allow ourselves to go outside of it. But not you know, we are we're not always either able or willing to do it, given other things that are outside of just the design and just the creativity aspects. Right. And I would say this is this is what drives uh, this tension that we need to find, that we need sometimes just enough creativity just for, for it to be within the rules that are expected. And, and sometimes we, we need to, to be full on this side to escape the, pragmatis the current pragmatism that has been applied. I don't know if it makes sense to you. Uh, well, it, it does. I, I think one of the things that's that's interesting is the the kind of invisibility of creativity and the visibility of pragmatism, right? That that you can demonstrate progress, you know, through a process. But if you're saying, mm -hmm. "Well, I'm just going to take a half a day to think about this interface," you know, people <laughs> people go bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> How does that fit in your time card? You know, I think it's it's part of that same it's part of that same problem. Um, that that there is a that there is a black box that's difficult to articulate around a creative process, and it just it leaves a um, it tilts the scales in terms of what part of the process overall is valued, right? That the pragmatism has the, has a because of its visibility in terms of progress, that kind of thinking, that kind of logical thinking that you can then stand behind and say, well, we did this testing and we did that, and we're following these rules and that, and there's a, you know somebody's paying the bills for this at the end of it. Um, whereas even kind of lightweight, anything that, anything that feels like a black box, right, in that process becomes devalued. Yeah. I, mean, I think that's, a, I think that's one, of the, one of the problems when you wrote out this kind of, this notion of the pragmatism versus the creativity, and I started looking at, well, okay, well, what are the threads, right? Where does, where does aesthetics fit, right? Where did Aristotle's poetics fit? And because, you know, like, how do you, how do you create a play, right? And yet in some weird way, like this poetics, which is seen as one of the foundational pieces of philosophy around creating art is in and of itself kind of pragmatic, right? Mm. So even in the description of that, it brings, because, because that's how you write about it, because it's, you know, it's different than saying, I go and, you know, walk along the ocean and ideas pop into my head, you know, ta-da. <laughs> yeah to, to what you say we, we like for others to be convinced in some way we need some kind of manufactured certainty right and that that's part of the pragmatism in design in especially in the process right because we cannot sell for for it we cannot actually sell the certainty of what we are doing we can only sell the idea that comes with this process, that some form of sanity is still here, right? That it's, it's, it's still there. But, but who can really sell that? Well, except, of course, design sprints and all these uh, dumb ideas that uh, we just need to follow a recipe and, and, <laughs> and ta-da, as you said. <laughs> so it yeah, happens. Following from this premise, there's... You know, you can actually make a distinction between practical and impractical constraints. You'll be like, yeah, well, they're practical, all of them, but actually by analyzing them and going a bit deeper, it's there's this realization that we place these quite arbitrarily and then we justify. But if there would be such a thing like, you know, like if you're placing certainty at the beginning and you have a good case for it, then you would be able to justify before you place the constraint. 
And I think that could give you a head start in understanding why it's important. Because then you kind of get used to it and you live with it and you take it for granted. And it's there because it's there. So it actually it gets uh, a lot harder to, to, to get rid of it. And I think that's what happens with the design sprints and things like that. Because they were, you know, assessing some sort of certainty. They were promising some level of knowledge that you will need and that you can acquire but the justification was made after in a sense they're like oh look at the success look at these different companies because this was the only way to gain credibility but in hindsight now we're looking at how this happened and we're just justifying something because it's happened not because it was good from the start <laughs> and i think that happens to, to a lot of the processes yeah, i mean it, it is possible to argue that the least creative thing that you can do is a brainstorming session. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's very true. Yeah. I mean, you don't do brainstorming to create. You just try to, you know, at least move your mind. You're creating a storm in your brain. That's not creative. That's destruction. It is. It is. And really, your job as a designer is actually kind of a, a FEMA, like, post-disaster role of the cleanup, to be honest. It's not the actual storm <laughs> that's productive. It's the, you know, when the clouds have passed in the end and you're picking up the pieces to see what happened, that you, <laughs> for lack of a better term, when you're assessing the damage. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you need to place constraints. That's what's happening. You know, the, the brainstorming gives but, you that justification for constraints. But, but in a sense, I, I want to ask a question. Like, if we go back, way back in time, and we say, Okay, when 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 a noble was, um, you know, uh, commissioning an artist to create a, a painting, like the the church did in many instances, were there any guarantee of the results? No, but still, like if it was not, I mean, if there were not some 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 form of tacit understanding of what could be delivered. Uh, we would not have so many paintings about, you know, <laughs> in these beautiful monuments and stuff like that, right? And, and in the same way, like, when 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 a noble or, like, especially people that had money, like, uh, paid someone to dress a horse to for some kind of specific, uh, you know, uh, um, a battle or something like that. The, like, they... they I, I like they didn't care so much about what kind of process the the guy will use to you know make sure that this the, the horse will do what what was expected from from him to do uh, like that that's a change in how we 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 how we place trust in 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 that process or in the end result and like I find it interesting to say that 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 it is like the that we we still have to sell the illusion of the result, right? In in the design process, and I, I feel like it. You know, this is where it, it loses any form of pragmatism and any form of uh, logic, right? It's it's not logical to to do it, but we do it because it it is asked from a logical standpoint that business people want ha to have some guarantee that, that they don't just waste money on, on something, right? But here we jump, like it's a leap from a logical uh, request to an illogical and in the magical land of, you know, business <laughs> business management. <laughs> there's one, if you, if you want to go back, there's there's a point in history, um, if you look at the design of gardens, where you would notice a real switch, right? So if you, from a Renaissance, like garden to a Baroque mm -hmm. kind of garden, or even a building, what you would have been commissioning beforehand, you would have, the, the outcome would have been somewhat predetermined because it would have been built on a certain formal logic, um, like a humanist formal logic. I'm in the middle, I look out, I can see these things, they line up and like these these views. And so you would have kind of known what that was. Later on, 
one of the things that you would have been commissioning in Baroque times would be surprise, right? That the thing mm -hmm. that you would have been commissioning was actually something that you wanted to, to be surprised by, right? Because all of a sudden the thought of who we were as being able to understand the world from a single point of view, you know, all of a sudden, you know, there's a philosophical, well, not like a, an, an understanding that the earth isn't the center of the world, that bodies are in motion, that we should start to experience things. There's this notion that we are not kind of like stationary subjects, but moving subjects and our emotions become very important. And in, in that point, there was this kind of, this notion of what it would be that you were paying for, right? Mm -hmm. That you were paying for, that you were, that you were commissioning. And in one case, you would have kind of known what to expect. And then the other one, you were specifically commissioning something that you didn't know what to expect. And the more unexpected it was, the greater the value in what it was that you were commissioning. So I think that there, 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 there are points in time where the notion of what it, the notion of the outcome is different. And I think we're in a particular part of that where the notion of the outcome is, you know, expected in a certain way, whether that's business results, you know, eyeballs, market share, stickiness, <laughs> you know, all, the, <laughs> but, all that. But in a sense, it's still expected to be unexpected. Like there, there's still this uh, idea that the designer should bring something, something different, right? Oh, to a point, to a point, because if you come back with something that they don't recognize or that is really, it really would depend on the client. Mm. The number, the number of projects that we've had that start out with client statements, like, you know, based on differentiation and every, <laughs> every review along the way brings it closer and closer to the norm. Yeah. Right. It's less and less risky essentially. Right. Yeah. So, um, and it, I mean, it depends on the sector for sure, but that, that does, that does happen. Just, I don't know. I'm trying to remember if I, I can think of a single instance where after the first review, the idea was more risky rather than less. Even even in even in sectors where you could take bigger chances. Yeah. Right. But what what obviously changed, we can say it is that before like there were no markets competition as well. Like there, there's some changes on what defines success as well that 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 changed oh but there were still status right you were commissioning back then you were commissioning these people as a matter of status and it wasn't a matter of competition yes so there was a market it wasn't it wasn't a it wasn't a financial market but there yes. was a market that was based on you know reputation and prestige and that kind of thing right? mm -hmm. so you, you know the court the court was in essence a market that traded in power in some way right power and prestige sure yeah, I agree. Yeah, but but there's this uh, sense of now things must be explicit, right? That it yes. was not as explicit as as, as it as, as it seems to be today, right? And uh, the, the, it seems like if the if something wins on the markets, it's because it's uh, it was obviously better. That there's some kind of objectivity mm -hmm. upon what succeed on 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 markets today. That that was probably less uh, like less believed in in the past. Maybe I I, I don't know. Maybe yeah, I'm just less, making that up. Less, less, less quantitative. It was less quantitative for sure. Yeah. But now thinking about it, it's a very interesting parallel in terms of things like word of mouth. Mm -hmm. Right. You know how that. It's, it's, anyway, yeah, I've never really considered it kind of that way, but there is a potential interesting parallel in terms of reputation and word of mouth and, and how that how that actually works and how the the stories of something move i mean it was still like a, a meme of some kind before the term was invented right it was <laughs> some kind of, did you see such and such as garden we must go there for the fall whatever you know it's, yeah, yeah. The, the trouble is that you don't have unsplash to get inspiration, you know, as a, I think now the people have become more, I don't know, fussier. They, they have higher expectations because they can see 
multiple designers work everywhere it's it's not like back in the day you would trust that person to to have enough talent and experience to deliver for you and you know with that level of surprise and certainty what you try to fill up with and referrals and maybe look at what others are doing but the comparison works on very small and isolated scale but now if i want a piece of work i can look at thousands and thousands i can just put it on 99 designs and i will find what i maybe want but that really increases the kind of demand uh and expectation on designers to for something and i think this is you know even though back in the day this was a very competitive space now it's it's almost like it's saturated with competition mm-hmm. uh, well, although you still have the I don't want it to look like everybody else, but I'm still only willing to pay for the lowest denominator stock photo if I want to pay it all. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who who would hire like a like a, a photograph for for a few days to to make some specific photo when 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 you can buy something like really cheap and you know not original but at least doing the job right it's a good enough uh, really you excellent. don't want a portrait of your family <laughs> and wait three years for it to be delivered <laughs> <laughs> yeah but c- c- coming back to what Jonathan said about the fact that physical the difference between physical objects and, and digital uh, objects is um, I, I do feel like there's something with with the digital that is in the in the sense of the you know the, the fact that we 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 are things seems to be explicit today the medium through which we design is an explicit one that there's no um, there's less ambiguity about what it is and what it can be uh, compared to a physical object that can be in different places and can play different roles depending on that context and and even just depending on who is in the room at this moment right like Of course, uh, um, 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 like um, um, like a piece of furniture is a piece of furniture. Like with with drawers, stuff like that, will have like a specific and we will have a specific understanding of what can what what is it the role of that object in that space. But if you were to put that that object in other other place than a room, it could be it could be something totally understood in a totally different way if you put it in the street what can people do with it is totally unexpected uh and totally random and then can be like different things right which is cannot be something that cannot be true for websites or for um sis uh, uh, product for instance right yeah. the, and and this explicit yeah this this The, the fact that it's explicit in its nature reduces the opportunities for creative uh, use of like there, there were an aspect of of the design that that wasn't expected how people will understand the final product and will use it that people have the choice about what the object can can be actually and and repurpose it for something else that the the, the designer has no control over right w- which cannot be true at all for a digital uh object and um and uh, this reduces the 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 viability in outputs and and how people can understand things but it reduces also how we think about those objects how we design for them right and and the developers sorry for developers are the <laughs> are the, the 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 best example in that sense that um they 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 think like machines right they, they, and they are trained to think like machines and for that they, they It's, it, I, I do feel like it's hard for them. Like when, when even when you see you you say something that that is not so extraordinarily uh, creative about uh, what we could do with a product or what we could do with a be- website, uh, I, like I, I, like it happens most of the time that they they they, they see oh you you are too creative for what we can do about you know about what we we are developing right and and that's because the. I, I don't want to go in the direction that uh, you know, as Orwell 
uh, deal with language that reduces uh, how we can think about uh, how what we can think uh, uh, like words constrain um, our ability to think. Uh, in the same sense that uh, development uh, or code and language uh, uh, can reduces how people think about it, but but we still take for granted um, what a website is and what it should do, right? And there's really not so many alternatives to that because of the space it lives in. And I, I feel like it's that it's it's one of the aspects that that makes us also think like that because it is expected because of the medium we are playing with in a sense. Yeah. That was, that was kind of what I meant by the, by the rails, right? If you're designing a train, you can yes. design the car, but a certain part of it that, you know, that is because it's part of a system, a rail system in that case, you know, that you, well, except, you, you, you think, except, yeah, you if you are, right? except if you are Elon Musk and you say now it's Hyperloop. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a train it's not a train on on rails it's uh um lifting magnets in uh you know uh <laughs> it's a pod it's a pod in a tunnel without air <laughs> <laughs> what could go wrong? Yeah, exactly. uh, but but you have the same kind of promises and um and pre yeah premises in um, in Web3 discourse, right? That they will revolutionize what is the, the underlying uh, meaning of web, for instance. And and here, in terms of philosophy, it's really interesting how how they never think they never thought about the, the philosophical ground in which they they were going through, right? It, it, it's it's like it's 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 first level of understanding. Like we will give people ownership over their data, but then when when we you dive a bit deeper in the f- underlying meaning of all of that, you realize that some of the the ideas are just philosophically bankrupt. Like they 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 like it cannot really happen in the in the sense that they they expect it to ha- happen, right? And it goes with as well this, you know, limitation of how we think about uh, the medium. But I, I spoke too much. Uh, who wants to say something? <laughs> well, um, about your question of how do you resolve the tension uh, between pragmatism and creativity. I I think that there are, you know, two ways to go about it. You can either have one win or the other win, right? You can either go more creative or you can go more pragmatic. To be more pragmatic would be to apply a type of risk management strategy onto both creativity and certainty, right? So then basically you can calculate and create within a system how you manage creativity and take calculated risks, right? That's, so that's the, the more conservative approach and probably the more liberal approach would be to basically live every single investment as if it were your last, right? That's <laughs> like what Square... Uh, did with Final Fantasy, hence the name Final Fantasy. Every single Final Fantasy, they just blow their entire budget on the success of that one game franchise, right? And and now they've diversified, but in the beginning, they were just, you know, always all in, you know? And, and in a sense, this is risk management, but like in the completely dumb sense, right? <laughs> of, of no risk management. The only risk management is is to take away all the insurance and expose yourself to complete danger on the other side. And you might actually get the best production out of your employees because of it. That, th- there's a Chinese um, saying that like when your back is uh, behind the wall or something, you fight the hardest, right? And, and military strategists um, have, have employed this 
uh, by by basically trapping their their army, um, you know, by the river. So there's no exit. And then you have to fight uh, with your back against the river and and you win even with your uh, army outnumbered. So. um, So, yeah, I mean, again, I think that there are these you can either go one direction or the other. And hence, this is why we live in a digital world, right? The digital world tells us that there's in every question, there's a true and false. And when and when the system is dynamic to where not one thing is consistently true or consistently false, then you can actually discover randomness or discover things that such as complex dynamics uh, within systems, right? Like coin flips, for example, inherently random system. But you can discover that it's random simply by inconsistency, right? And so when you, you know, kind of mention the idea that there are these, you know, design principles of like, you know, perfection, good design, whatever, all these like nice, nice sounding things. And then at the end of the day, when you look at things like, you know, gimping or nerfing or, you know, design obsolescence that inherently manifests itself in these products, then you realize that that this inconsistency is, um, you know, just a feature of this coin flip uh, system. And I think that's that's a nice, you know, that that's one way I view it. I think one thing, too, is. But we've talked a lot about the idea that design is more about the outcome than the thing, right? What is it that that it can do? And so one reason, we might, or we might be looking too deep into this, is one reason all of the work looks the same is because all of the outcomes that are desired are the same, right? That you take a step further beyond Hmm. beyond that that, that that if you wanted different outcomes there would be more room for creativity there would be more room for um, finding results like like for example at the beginning um, there were all of these questions around when you're designing a mobile app where do you put the primary button right And now what you want is you want efficiency, but over time, people have determined what the best placement for that is. So now that those options have been narrowed down because the outcome that we want is efficiency. And therefore, this is where you put the button for a right-handed person and a left-handed person and larger phone sizes now. You know, this is where it has to be because of the range of thumb and that that whole thing, right? So you have these, these things that you learn about the medium and because the outcome that you want is always efficiency, you end up with similar looking results. Potentially. I don't know. I mean, that's a question, I guess. Like, is it, are we, are we focusing too much on the product and not enough on the outcome that we desire from the product and the sameness of those outcomes? I mean, there's a lot to be said about that, but I think what, what's going on overall is this seriosity you know you you we're taking things too seriously sometimes and we're trying to justify or mine some some philosoph- philosophy out of it but actually the the whole practical aspect is being able to switch on and off different philosophies at different times and like you say efficiency and you know for the most part i am comfortable with having that middle button but i want that to you know no i don't want to have it set in stone for me that's just another way things can be and hopefully at some point they can change but i think what's going on is people are trying to always yeah again aim towards that uh, precision and kind of set it in stone and designers sometimes fall into that pit which you know can cause all this distress and why the digital is so rigid and then the web 3.0 comes on top and says like we're revolutionizing but they're just you know rewashing and reshuffling things and they're not actually even aware of the potential outcomes because mm-hmm. they imagine something that wasn't imagined previously it's a bit dif- difficult and of course to imagine a need for that and it's 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 always you know is it real you know, no you have to make it up no 
Sorry, you're you're trying to say something. So so I. I, I would I would I would like to uh, make uh, one comment and link back with what Mark says said just now. So the first is I I'm not convinced that the uh, 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 you know there is a dichotomy between pragmatism and creativity. I agree with that that idea. Um, I think these two notions are quite uh, orthogonal, and I think. It comes back to what Mark was saying before. Uh, there's this notion of uh, abduction in, in design, obviously, where you start from, and the basic idea is you go from the function, as you were saying, or the, 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 the needs, uh, and you work backwards towards a solution that will uh, satisfy those needs. And the, the idea is that that is an abductive I think you're breaking up again. <laughs> yeah, we're losing you, Jonathan. <laughs> Process. Yeah, sorry, Jonathan, we, we don't hear you anymore. That's uh, it's really like um, cut in the middle of your sentences each time. We don't hear you well. I'm sorry. I don't know if it's Kumo Space that does that because <laughs> because like it's uh, it's each time it's uh, you have problems with uh, <laughs> with that. I'm sorry, Jonathan. I don't know if you want to to write down in the chat if you can by any any chance write down what you wanted to say. Oh, oh. he left. I probably he won't. He will come back. Yeah. Yeah, but like I mean, you know, a closing thought that maybe to think about round it to this marriage idea. Yeah. I think I, I don't want it to end in a divorce because there hasn't <laughs> been like a serious conflict. You know, there, there can be, you know, some platonic love between design and philosophy. Is they can trial, be friends. Is trial separation? Is that what you want, like a trial separation? Separate bedrooms for now? <laughs> I think it can, yes. I think they need some space in between, but they can still live in the same house and you know work together <laughs> you know and, and yeah have a have the yeah, kids have the when, you know when we can then uh... <laughs> design and philosophy are staying together for the kids <laughs> it's a reality that's practical in a sense because you know they don't hate each other it's just the the, the flame has uh uh, kind of gone off for a while, and I don't know if it can be reignited. I don't know if there can be a, maybe like in a in a utopian future you'll have philosophy and design mm. unified and being one and the same, and we'll have this ideal army of design philosophers, whatever. But I don't think that's possible right now. So we'll who we wants an this. army of design philosophers? <laughs> they and I. <laughs> you never know. Yeah. Well, the other one too is when somebody comes in and says, "Well, there's a good reason to be creative." <laughs> so yeah i don't know what you guys think but i think you know i want to have always the freedom to go back to philosophy bring some stuff and then come back in i want to dispose of them when i feel like it's too much yeah and i think having this freedom as a designer and as a person in general not to have to identify with your ideologies all the time and have to feel compelled to make choices just because you adhere at some point to it I think that's uh, really unhealthy. So at least yeah. for the sake of philosophy and design, friends, but not uh, <laughs> not really friends, friends, but not lovers. Yeah, like that. Let's let's not go into this toxic relationship. Just <laughs> I know that. <laughs> uh, I, I tend to agree with you. Uh, no, actually, I, I totally agree with you, uh, Diana. I, I feel like one of the of the strengths of what we do is. Um, yeah, it comes from 
from the practice itself that we we need to shift like it is the it's the same thing as the fact that design for many things is at the interaction uh, at intersection sorry of many other disciplines is that that we need we need those other aspects to be able to do what we do and in the same manner that we we have to adopt the different philosophies to be able to to work with the complexity of the world so i'm i'm totally fine with this uh loose definition of uh philosophy for 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 designers um and i think the um, the, the toxicity is 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 actually coming from people who want us to stick to uh, to to or uh, yeah to adhere uh to death to certain principles or certain ideas right and um and i think it's uh, personally i feel like it's true for other things than than just design uh, <clears throat> uh yeah now now what what does it mean in terms of uh ethics uh of being able to switch our minds uh you know switch our uh, the basis on which we we decide things is an interesting question but it's not um it's not something that needs to be solved as as the tension doesn't needs to be does not need to be resolved uh, because because the tension between pragmatism and, and creativity for me is a useful one is the one that we need to ponder uh, given the context we are working in and that's that in that sense it's, it's it is useful because it, it provides um, it provide with uh, like these distinctions requires us to think about those things you know to to and to make decisions about those things like when the, it does not exist uh like we just make decisions and what what they actually means is you know not our from our yeah understanding or we we leave it to others to decide <laughs> right and in that sense it's a it's yeah it's it's a loss for for what we are doing so I, i'm totally fine with that but i i don't know if you have different a different understanding I think, well, one of the things that we are running into, which is not uncommon, is this notion of philosophy as a mode of inquiry or like that and a philosophy, right? Like some, something like that. And I think that the idea of design as a mode of inquiry is really interesting because you can inquire in a different way when you make something and you put it into a context, right? And so I think yeah. that, that that to me is still interesting because whether or not we want to do it, we are putting something into the context, you know, that, that there will be some kind of out, out, um, outcome from what it is that we're doing. And mm. philosophy seen as a, you know, as an act, as a verb, is doing that thoughtfully. Right? thinking about the context, thinking about the effect on context, understanding the way that we dwell, right? and the way that the things that we put into the world are going to reinforce or disrupt patterns that we're looking at. And I think that thinking about it as, a, as, a, as design as a mode of inquiry mm -hmm. brings it together, and that very much removes the, the line between pragmatism and creativity because it's the inquiry that's important. On the other hand, when you say, you know, does this esp espouse a um, a specific philosophy? It's it it becomes a a statement rather than an inquiry, mm -hmm. right? And the problem with that, and you've seen it with project managers that are, you know, like the sprint guys or the agile guys or something yeah. like that, where they defend the process, they defend the process uh, in in a more fervent way than they do the product. Right? Yeah, that, that that becomes something that becomes something different. So I, I think that there's the notion that where for me there is this convenient marriage, you know, for the or maybe relationship cohabitation for the benefit mm -hmm. of the kids is in this notion of design as a mode of inquiry. Yeah, right. yeah, I, it's I ironic agree. that. Yeah, go ahead, Matt. It, it's ironic that um, you know the 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 work flow uh agile is quite the opposite of what the name suggests uh, but, um, <laughs> yeah that's true. because it's, it's, it's a more of a ritualistic um yeah. religion of you know of of teamwork rather than um you know displaying agility but mm -hmm. um but with that being said 
the end result, the outcome, the precision, right, is 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 a counterintuitive success story. You know, the the process of using you know agile and Scrum and these processes that are kind of designed, all like you know cookie cutter template designed, right, to to get people to work together, because there is a type of efficiency that is captured in these types of processes that hasn't been discussed much. Namely that, um, you, like it was the example that you mentioned, Mark, which is like, let's brainstorm together. That's, that's a ridiculously, um, you know, non-creative, you know, suggestion, but, um, you, you know, it's, it's, we have, we have, modes of communication, which are, you know, in the form of writing and spoken words. But I, but one of the things that is missing is the ability to just have, have behavior be a form of communication itself, you know, like really have, have it be in a direct, you know, um, uh, sensory impulse in like, you know, impulse in your brain type of, um, uh, type of stuff. Mm -hmm. And rather than uh, having to go through explanation, you, you just have it a process that is pre-established and just make it into a religious learned behavior approach. I mean, it's, it's one of those weird things where it's remarkably effective when you take away critical thinking. Yes. Yes, and that's one of the goal. Like we have, we have to acknowledge the fact that it's one of the goal of the, of the method, actually. It's is to gain this 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 efficiency through behavior that is required to be to to, to be done right that there's a, a need to to do it and it's not about thinking about it right it's about actually yeah. performing right you, in that you sense take it, away the redundancy of communication yeah um, but but that's a valid thing to to do in many instances. That I, I don't want to uh, diminish the importance of that, and that that we, we we can see it in culture in general. That it has its value and its merits to to exist, and it's it's what it's part of the of the of the yeah. I don't like specifically the, the this term, but the, the social constructs that that makes what the culture is, what the 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 team is, what yeah, so it's it's important that then when it's uh, you know when it's uh, when it's uh, weight uh, is more when we put too much emphasis on that and not on the rest, like you, you have always the, the you know the risk of being in a, in a place where you don't want to be like that. There's too much of that and not enough of other things, right? Well, you get the self, you get the alienation, right, of, of yeah. market forces, and you get all this, you know, these political left uh, counter um, influences because of because of this problem that uh, uh, that that this s s super specialization uh, kind of imposes on on its people, on on you know, basically just having. Having you know leaders, business leaders, companies impose this type of leverage on uh, its workers to behave in you know in, in a specific way to specialize in this mode in this um, non-critical thinking alienation mode. It it does have ethical implications. Those will never be explored in time to really counteract. Um, and I think this is one of the, the real worries, the real critical worries when we say the word ethics and when we really mean the word ethics, that this is, this is the real fear is that we, we've gone past the, the, the Rubicon. We, there's no going back now and mm. there's no reversal of this. And so we just, and it might be too late to really, re to effectively change the course of history to counteract the, this, you know, alienation that writ large, right? Um, but, uh, it, uh, you know, maybe to speak a little bit more positively too, um, you do get, even though you get alienated um, type of forms of uh, design or whatever, you do get designed by committee. You do get designed by this 
you know, this big macro brain, if you will, uh, through leverage. And you do get, you might actually get superior products out of it, right? So um, it's, it's, it's all, all in all, not, not a bad thing, but it is a deal with the devil that we didn't really make the decision on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it's a, a macro brain, like if, I, I would say if it's it's fits design, it it has to come from some type of type of intent, and and that means that this macro brain that is, if I understand well, is the like the combination of all the parts like of the the subsystem right, which is the team or the teammates and stuff like that, um, that they all not necessarily agree one hundred percent, but they all agree with some kind of intent, common intent, shared intent that we want to 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 achieve and in, in that sense uh, it's still design when it's just alienated with no not without this intent uh, I, I, to me it, it it loses this status of design and it's just a random accident in that sense right uh, it, it can happen like good accident happens right <laughs> then. then uh, uh, and I, I, I think we, we spoke about that uh, with Diana uh, on happy accidents, and uh, I think it's part of of the of the process as well. Um, but if it's just that, uh, I don't think we can call that design, right? So, yeah. But uh, maybe I'm playing with the <laughs> the words here. Um, <clears throat> um, I don't know. I wanted to say something else, but I think Jonathan wrote on chat um, a uh, a quote. Yeah, two quotes. <laughs> yeah, oh, a speculative yeah. problem is solved as soon as it is properly stated, but stating the problem is not simply uncovering; it is inventing. Henry Bergson. And the other one is to find a problem is thus the same thing as finding the solution. The problem can be defined until the solution has been found. How street on. Yeah. I mean, in, in some ways, if we, like, su- suppose we live in a hypothetical utopian future where all knowledge has already been gained, um, the only activity that is left is to fabricate um, arguments in order to create content, right? Essentially, um, new modes of exploring and re-arriving at the, at the conclusions, at the knowledge that we've already gained, right? To, to, to re-story, to re-energize. And in, in many ways, I think that design, the marriage of design and philosophy has to go through renewals in this similar way. Like, you know, a marriage ends in one or two ways. One is that the fire is gone and there wasn't any hope of rekindling it. The other is that the fire is way too strong and it's destructive for, for both. And so they mutually have to end it, right? It's, it's, it's either hot or cold. Um, and, and, and yeah, I mean, I don't know where I wanted to go with that metaphor, but <laughs> we're just constantly dancing around this metaphor. <laughs> We gotta tell the community what happened in the end with this marriage. Yeah. So oh, I guess this... I mean. Oh. Yeah. But like the now the question is where next? Now we'll have to discuss probably on our next uh, community workshop also. But it just you know, it makes me at least you know put an open question: What comes next after this series of entertainment? Uh, in philosophy and design. And of course, we discussed a lot of things on the side, but I'm curious, what is the next phase of it? Mm-hmm. And, and to what does it, will it transform? Because I don't know yet. I mean, we did have these conversations on a conceptual level, and we yeah. actually attained a lot of depth in, in, in some areas, which is really interesting. But now it's a, it's a question of, where do we put it do we put it in the context of making what makes us better designers do we put it in the context of 
the importance of having a community to discuss these. Do I don't know? Do we do we do? <laughs> well, I, I started a, a small project um, right after the first uh, marriage of design and philosophy um, discussion, where I I made an app called Alien Logic, which is just about decision making and using um, like you know two equations from information theory to help people assess uh, three the the qualitative um, decision making of three choices right and you can weigh the two weigh the three uh based upon like what your expectations are and the risk reward of of each of these three and um and so like you know in my opinion like it's it's probably a project a lifelong project where i'll i'll continue to you know improve this app and and whatnot and i think you know um I'm just saying that, like, at least there's a legacy out of this. So, you know, um, you know, I'll, I'll keep updating the community of what I do with it. And uh, you can track the progress if you want. It's just a small little pet project. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah. So, so, so you lied a bit when you said that you are not a designer. Right? Because in a no, sense... No, no, no. You, I, I'm not. Because a, in a sense... Clearly. You, you you are not one by title. You are one by trying things. Practice. <laughs> yeah, actually. I, I, I wouldn't even say by practice, but I, I think that... So for me, I am a philosopher. I'm not really an app designer. I have app designing skills, and but I don't want to make money. I don't want to make money. I do want to teach people about concepts. I do want people writ large to be better decision makers and to understand um, that there is something in between being right and being wrong that's special. And that specialness is you know, information entropy, or if you will, something between creativity and, and, and whatnot. But what, what, yeah, I mean, those are your boundaries, right? Of being right or wrong. And it's some, being somewhere in the middle is a good place to be, um, to to discover and find better uh, solutions. Hmm. Yeah, and, and I want people to understand that. I want people to actually like feel it, learn it, and make decisions based off of it, and 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 to and to be comfortable with failure. In by by democratizing this this notion of of information entropy, I guess if you if you will, to uh, to, to be really cheesy here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but that's that's uh, in that sense. I I don't want to be like uh, strict to the terms and stuff like that. Just in that sense, you had this intent and you 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 put it in into a process that allowed you to do something with it that you know achieved a certain medium that you hope will you know generate the outcomes you want to see. Right. That's right. Sense. Right. I, it, it's given me, I guess, a a, a long pathway. Because mm -hmm. now every week I can write an article to talk about decision making and then, <laughs> and then write a, an example of how it's done on the app to decide uh, mm -hmm. based off of these three things. You know, I, I compare, you know, Coca-Cola's and Pepsi's marketing strategies using the app and, and stuff like that. So to, you know, kind of understand where Pepsi is a little bit over leveraged in their, you know, like, you know, um, pop stars and music and all that stuff, you know, and stuff like that. Right. And, um, cool. yeah, using Kelly criterion and stuff like that. So it's, I don't know. I think it's, uh, it's an interesting exercise. I think people, people lay, I, I want to write this for the lay people, right. You know, not someone who's not, uh, you know, a professional or a mathematician mm. or anything like that. I just, you know, I, I feel like when you, um, and, and and I think this is why this type of discussion, when you can kind of reduce it to its core elements and then serve it as a platter to the lay person, you know, that has tremendous value. Um, and so I, I wouldn't say design and philosophy, you know, that it ends in divorce. I would say that, um, you know, it, like with anything, 
when philosophy is isolated or design is isolated, the the discourse um, either uh, continues or ends based upon, you know, just um, happenstance sometimes, right? Like maybe you d we, d we didn't have the critical number of people um, in this in this group and forum to to continue the energy and discussion mm -hmm. and, and it has nothing to do with a failure of you know design and philosophy not being compatible but it's just happenstance hmm. yeah i do feel like as well we we don't want necessarily to to go in the in the philosophy roots like too too far in that direction either right because it's not really the point it's just to see where 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 are the interesting connections between the two and 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 when probably by contrast when those co connections are not <clears throat> either enough interesting or enough useful in the practice of design to be really investigated or or just not enough in the sense to be to be good to be left uh, uh, on the side and 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 you know just like that in that sense right because we because we cannot explore everything about philosophy because otherwise it would be a, a philosophy discussion only and and you know and that uh, design discussion and philosophy uh, at the same time now what what would be the learning of that this that journey at least you know at the intersection of the two is a question that I don't have answers for right now. Um, but well, so one of the things that I'm kind of incorporating into not only just the app, but my articles is to also bring in philosophy into my articles too. Um, I, I want to, you know, kind of simplify philosophy in a way where, um, where, where it can be served to the lay person, right? And there's many modes of how you do it. One way is, you know, you can make YouTube uh, videos and content and actually just talk about philosophy in a fun way, right? Mm -hmm. to, to bring in an entertainment aspect. But the entertainment might not have that pragmatic, you know, utility function um, associated with it. So in order to address this utility function, this is one of the reasons why I decided to go with the direction of an app, which is something that is kind of like a modern day calculator, but a calculator of a different sort, right? Because if you need to do a complex calculation, one that your brain cannot handle right away, right? You take out your calculator, your phone, and mm -hmm. you, you punch in a few numbers, one plus one equals you know two, right? And you, you get the answer. But I think decision making, you know, it's it's one of the things that um, information theory has given us a quantitative tool to assess quantitatively, but we don't we don't use it. We we rely on our gut feelings, intuitions, and emotions. Now, I I I don't want to discount emotions. I think that emotions are emotions and intuition are really important things. For instance, like one one intuition that we all share when it comes to reputation is when we think about a comedian or a magician right a, a, a funny guy a funny guy or girl has to like hit i guess like maybe 80 90 percent of their jokes to make you laugh right because because if, if if one if if 50 percent of the jokes offends you and and doesn't make you laugh it's you know this person's not funny anymore right <laughs> this person's offensive or, or rude right mm -hmm. um and si similar with a magician a magician has to hit on point everything can't flop can't make a mistake otherwise the magic is gone you know this, yeah. this person isn't a magician this person is just doing magic tricks right and, and oh. reputation kind of works similarly in this way, which is that you, there is a little form of self-deception where you allow yourself to believe in magic, where you allow yourself to believe that this person can be infinitely funny, that this person is by by virtue of being funny. You know, this is this is a practice of philosophy but on an intuition level, on a, on a layman, um, you know, uh, level, and it's based upon pattern recognition. And there is a practical aspect of it, which is 
um, in information theory, it's signal to noise, whatnot. But uh, you know, uh, uh, having having an awareness of it, right, comes with having the right tools. We, we do have the right tools in terms of language, but we don't have it in terms of having a calculator at hand. And that's why I wanted to bring this, this app as a type of calculator. I'm not sure the, how I have it right now is even good looking. It's totally beta, right? <laughs> the questions that I have are like, you know, they take up half of the screen. So I need to like figure out how to like reduce all of these questions um into a way where like you know a novice can use it but you know the core of the idea is to you know kind of have like a ui ux where you can kind of like scroll put in numbers without having to type things in and and, and i think i think in the long run you know somebody will make it if not me right um because this this seems to be something that is just missing in human history right now um you know, like it's it's like if Kant wasn't born, history would have invented him, right? Same thing with like <laughs> Jesus, right? It's, it, it, this just kind of needs to be there in a sense. So, yeah, <clears throat> and then that's that's where this is leading me in terms of my design pr practice or principles, if you will, is that I, I'm operating on the on the suspicion that if if I were not to create it, how would it? look like right how would someone else do it in other words hmm. it's a nice project you know i'm not making <laughs> any money out of it it's 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 a passion but, project but there's a high level of uh of belief in what you're doing which is which is interesting <laughs> i would say this is a, a theme uh mark diana Schnitz, and everyone in, in design as well uh the, the topic of beliefs uh, uh, I think it, it can links back to decision making and action and stuff like that. But that, um, uh, yeah, that's interesting. Now, now for 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 the time remaining, because I, I plan one hour and half for for this one, we are like a bit of a, <laughs> of a bit. So as usual, um, <clears throat> so um, the the question is: Do we want to? like to have some kind of answer to the question uh that diana asked like what do we do with all of that and do we have like a uh some form of synthesis of this discussion that leads to something and it, can we continue it with another theme that is connected or not at all because it's absolutely not uh required uh, i don't know we we make up the the rules right so <laughs> <laughs> but other constraints, <laughs> not the question. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I, I don't know if you have anything in mind about 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 that because we can totally do it in another session. Like we have the uh, community workshop that is also planned where we can wrap up the discussion. Um, so do I was we? Say, we might need yeah. a bit of time to you know let it sink in because yeah. I feel like you know this cycle has ended, but. It still takes time to, to come to the surface and uh, yeah, I just consider the next steps. I think uh, we could use a bit of extra time before making statements and see mm -hmm. what changes what lies ahead. Yeah. Because if I recall well, I mean, around this time of the year, it's the community's second birthday, right? Yes. Yeah. It's... Uh... Actually, it's next next week. Uh, is uh, is the the real <laughs> anniversary? Uh, it's, I think it's on the twenty two for twenty. No, no, it's it happened already. It's uh, it's yesterday. Uh, it was uh, yesterday. Uh, the creation of this community was yesterday, uh, two years ago. Um, now. Uh, we cannot, uh, yeah, it was hard to do the anniversary and stuff like that. And I don't know if we want to do it this year as we did last, last year, because it, it was, uh, funny, but exhausting at the same time. <laughs> so I, don't, I don't know if we want to, yeah. to, to, to do it the same way, or if we want to do something different, or we do something like, but, you know, simple. And we say like next year, we, we plan a big trip and we meet in real, you know, in, Ereal and and uh, I don't know, uh, like um, 
we have to meet maybe, each other at some point, you know, <laughs> in the real world. Maybe that's the, the theme of the community workshop to discuss a bit, you know, the two years sort of and what's next, like more of a, on a broader scheme and kind of integrate these different components, what we've done so far this year, like a reflection moment and, you know, next steps. Mm -hmm. I think that would be like a, like a pivotal workshop. You know, because we got the new regular, we got Matt. Yeah. We lost a few on the way, a few good soldiers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I should, I, I try to make, sh I, I want to make sure that, uh, I just don't see you no know, shit about the, the anniversary date. I remember it was around the 20 something, but I, I don't actually, it's a shame. I don't remember exactly which day. Maybe I am just, yeah, I'm a bit confused right now. <laughs> Maybe it was not yesterday. Um, I have to find, I, I probably can find this information on the Slack server when it was created because basically the community yeah, existed at the same 26, time. Yeah, but. Yeah, yeah, maybe it's twenty six. No, I don't know better. Yeah. <laughs> apparently, <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, yeah, I will confirm the dates actually uh, once I found it. Um, yeah, you wanted to say something, Mark? Uh, no, I, I do think it's good to have a little bit of time to. To let this let this sink in and figure out what comes next. Um, so yeah, so we'll set, set a date, or we have also a Slack channel to work on. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. Th this I have, to, um, I actually have to. I have to. I have to jet because I've got a call coming up. So okay. Um, as always, it's been sweeping and only uh, tenuously related to the topic. <laughs> um, so <laughs> it's always always appreciated. But uh, but yeah, I'll catch you guys next time. Okay, yeah. thank you very Bye, much. Cheers. See you Bye. next time. Thank you, everybody. Cheers. Bye. Uh, yeah, I still have some, like, personally, I, I still have some subjects that I feel like are not tightly, but loosely connected to all the discussion we had so far. Um, but uh, I don't know if this, these are the discussions we want to, to have. So, and yeah, uh, I don't well, necessarily want to go for that, but... I think what would have been interesting as a format is to, you know, we discussed that a long time ago about you bringing a struggle. Oh, little Valafar. <laughs> but like bringing a struggle and then the others sort of trying to help out, whether it's a project, whether it's something difficult. And within this philosophical setup, uh, it actually would have been interesting to, to try that, to experiment a little with something that we find extremely difficult like you know uh, matt prompted in the second discussion around decision making i think it would have been interesting to say what makes it so difficult for us on a personal level because it is sort of about us more so than it is about the greater world at least within the space and uh, yeah it would have been interesting to, to see how that turns out I mean, I want to check out uh, Matt's app once it's uh, it's perfected because I have a I can make decisions, but I have a very hard time accepting my own decisions, mm. even though they can be said at the best. <laughs> so. Well, um, let me tell you what it can and cannot do. What it what it cannot do is tell you what to do, but what it can do is analyze based upon your expectations. Um, of, of, you know, basically it doesn't ask you about um, the probability of something happening, but what your expectations are of the probability happening and the risk reward, right? And so then you would know, or at least once you um, put, put in input those um, answers, right? So three decisions, two variables for each decision. So six variables total. You would know, um, based upon the strategy that you're optimizing for, which is either maximum entropy or uh, being on the conservative side or being on the 
exploration side, right? Like you want to be wrong, but you just want to be crazy. Um, those those are the three decisions, right? Uh, and I, I, you can come up with many, many more. But the idea here is what is sufficient for you? Because if you were going to allocate five hours of your time to, um, to, to I don't know, research something and you have like an 80% chance of it succeeding, right? It would actually tell you, my app, right? If you were to like try to maximize entropy, it would actually tell you to reduce that five hours down to one hour because it would be sufficient enough based upon the high certainty that you, you have of achieving that answer, right? So, so basically it would be a time saver for you, right? So that's, that's mm -hmm. what the app kind of does is that it tells you if you're over allocating resources, you know, in, in this case, your time, or if you're under allocating, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it could kind of adjust and compare those three decisions based upon your, your intended strategy. So it, it allows you to make decisions by being more rational and, <laughs> and learning that you're more rational. But, but, instead but of, you instead cannot of, bet on, yeah. on, on the behavior that follows. Like you cannot bet on, right? Yeah. You cannot bet no, on someone no. actually you know, taking down to the later what what is uh, what is what the, the application uh, tells you to to uh, 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 do in a rational way. You know what they say: you you can't you can take a horse to the river, but you can't make him drink water. That's <laughs> basically it. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's how it's interesting. It's just... it, it makes it makes things it makes something visible, just enough for you to take that piece of information. In consideration, but you can clearly not expect the information to be and it could actionable. You, yeah, necessarily. It right. can give you like insight into how you usually structure things. And you know, if you said about expectation, I was like, maybe when a decision is important to me, I tend to like have a higher uh, expectation of risk rather than of winning because simply because I'm just stressed out about how important it is, but it's mm. not assessing it correctly. 100%. And it's like what Jonathan said, that math and science have kind of take taken over philosophy, right? Um, I, want, I want it to kind of come back into philosophy by making um, the, the math of it is actually not that not that hard it's really simple and that's why i can just like turn it into an excel sheet and then turn that excel sheet into an app and then um i think the long-term goal is to basically have everybody put their decisions on there and everybody can see it and turn it into and right now the app does allow you to leave comments so you can have like forums and whatever to discuss like hey this is a decision and I mean, the premise behind it is to keep it anonymized, right? So then you can really, really grapple with the quality of your decision making rather than focus so much on um, pe people identifying you and stuff like that and having like, you know, your personal identify mm. data and, you know, basically having the risks associated with dealing with the digital world nowadays, right? The security issues. I want to take that off the table and and leave it into, like, turn it into more of a Wikipedia type of uh, thing, right? Like an open forum. And um, and obviously, like, down the road, if it's if it ever does become successful, it requires moderators and, and whatnot. But, you know, right now, it's, it's nothing um, except an, an idea. And, you know, I can share the link. You guys can test out the app, whatever. Yeah. Right now, I only have this one strategy, which is <laughs> max entropy. But, you know, um, it's it's a work in progress and you you guys can see the progress throughout the years. Right. Uh, yeah. of, of how 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 this goes. OK. OK, so, yeah, please yeah. Do, do share the link on, on the Slack, uh, whatever channel. Uh, um, and, and so people can check out your your app. Um, <laughs> I propose no, no, and then play and play with it, and then discover what, what all of that means for for themselves. Uh, and um, um, what I wanted to say, maybe we, like, yeah. So we take time to think about all of that. Uh, next Tuesday is the community workshop, so uh, let's see 
what we can come with as a conclusion or a wrap up to to, to that discussion about design and, and philosophy. I will try to write down something maybe in between to like lay, uh, you know, lay down my my thoughts. Um, and yeah, I am just dropping that uh, quickly. Like I have two or three other things in mind about topics that we could explore. Uh, just leave you with that so you can also let let them sink in and then see what you want to do with it but there's this um, discussion around um, around um, uh, uh, inactivism and the, the four E's of cognitive science that, that, that the change in paradigm and what, what does it mean for design which I feel is really interesting uh, is something that I'm really interested in uh, since a while uh, yes it's really long but i just realizing now i'm rediscovering it in a sense so i find it interesting i don't know if it can be in discussion in any way because i just don't want to make exposition about what it is and then uh, yeah to speak about it like it, it has to be a conversation in, in 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 a sense so so yeah i don't know really where we can go with that but maybe it's it's it can be something uh, and then there's this idea of metaphors. Uh, I see, uh, I, we, we explored it like loosely and not really, really, but it, it was a theme in many discussion we had um, in the past. Uh, we played with one with the island metaphor and stuff like that in the past. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's uh, actually a conversation we wanted to want to have to have again about metaphors uh maybe more like really about it and yeah that's what i have in mind but i'm really open to other dis decisions uh discussion sorry so don't hesitate to think about that and, and come with ideas uh next time yeah sounds good to me let's do that let's <laughs> pause on this and See what we can do with it. We can always go back to the island metaphor. I miss playing in that space. It was fun. Yeah. Taking one letter at a time. <laughs> yeah. Well, 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 yeah. With the island is, um, yeah. I, I found new ways of using this, that, that tool, by the way. So um, uh, in the meantime, I, I use it on, on projects. So I, I found new ways to, to use the tool. Um, Yes. I, I still, I still see like that is, you know, more to do about it, and uh, I still have like a coming soon page on the <laughs> on the framework <laughs> about the tool. So uh, maybe at some point we, it, yeah, we we I don't know if we need to, but it would be nice to come with something, you know, uh, about the tools. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's. Um, um, no, Jonathan that's said abduct abductive thinking. Okay. Yeah. What was abductive thinking again? So deductive, inductive, and abductive. What's what's abductive? Um so uh yeah, abductive reasoning is um yeah, I, I think it's about the metaphor. It's, it's coming in the same. Uh, yeah, I'm, I know Jonathan. You cannot speak. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry for you. It's, <laughs> it's not the idea why, but um, can look for it. Oh, got it. Yeah, Wikipedia yeah. saved me. <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I think that. Jonathan said a rule and case hypothesis. Yeah. 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 Why not? Um, so kind of like case studies, right? You, you take individual case studies, kind of like what Diana mentioned, which is like, you take one of our own projects and then talk about it. And then everybody criticizes it and figures it out. Yeah, in a sense, I mean, uh, kind of it, it's, yeah. Wait, do you have the definition with Wikipedia? So. This says an abductive reasoning, the major premise is evident, but the minor premise and therefore the conclusion are only probable. For yeah. example, if you find a half-eaten sandwich in your home, you might use probability to reason that uh, whatever, whatever, someone ate it. 
So it's, it's, it's really, yeah, it's starting from actually something from kind of uh, obvious from an observation. It starts with an observation yeah. or so, like a set of observations, and then you kind of extrapolate. But isn't it deductive reasoning then? No, because deductive would be that you are looking at, I mean, you could, yeah, it's tricky. We, we need to do this clear <laughs> difference. Yeah. I mean, the deduction, it's more like logical, but in yeah. here it's more like contextual. With abduction, you're looking, you're hoping that you have a person doing that, you know? No, no, no. The, the only thing with deduction would yeah. be just, yeah, the, the sandwich is eaten by someone but not who or why for whatever reason. So. Yes. <laughs> yeah, like thinking like a detective, a doctor, a designer. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm familiar with it. Um, I'm just, uh, I have to re, <laughs> you know, to, yeah. to re-read about it because I, yeah, I don't know why. It, okay, it, yeah. then we should put that on the list. Yes, uh, yes, clearly. topics, my interesting. So uh, what I will do is like I will share on the general channel like some of the uh, different ideas and you can jump in, add yours uh, by the time we have the conversation or just come during the to the workshop and come yeah. with your ideas. Okay. Yes. Cool. Well, then, go. yeah. See I'm you around. Dark for a long time. <laughs> Take care. Thank you very See much you for joining. Yeah.